Are you eager to explore the fascinating world of innovative cloud capabilities and their impact on the public sector markets? Are you looking to learn how one of the big three hyperscalers took a unique approach to solve for the strict compliance requirements of government security? Are you ready to tap into the opportunity to partner with Google Cloud's innovative public sector business? Well, whether you're a seasoned business owner, an alliance strategist, or a passionate entrepreneur ready to tap into new opportunities, then you come to the right place. Welcome to, or welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering, where technology leaders come to optimize results through successful partnering. I'm Vince Menzion, your host, and today I welcome Troy Bertram, the Executive Managing Director of Google Cloud's public sector business. In this episode, Troy and I discuss Google's partner-led and partner-first approach to the public sector, the company's extraordinary commitment to building this business, how it uniquely reached the highest levels of compliance and security to support the most stringent government customers, and why partners need to consider Google as they build their business strategy. I hope you enjoy and learn from this discussion as much as I enjoyed welcome, Troy Bertram. Troy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Vince. It's great to be here and excited to talk about our mission outcomes for our customers in education and government. I am so excited to welcome you finally as a guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. You're the Executive Managing Director of Google's Public Sector Partner Ecosystem. Your role is so exciting and your mandate is so important. So I thought we'd start there. Google set up this group just about a year ago. So I was hoping you could take us through the organization's mission and your role. As a separate operating unit under Alphabet, and it is the only one under the Alphabet Google umbrella, we are part of Google Cloud. Thomas Chirian is our CEO and Karen DeHert joined us this past year to lead Google Public Sector. Our charter is unique in that we are mission-oriented outcome to support the U.S. government and educational institutions. My team's mission, we've been at it since May of last year, and it was to build a world-class partner organization focused on partner outcomes. We go to market through partners, 100%. It's aligning to our partners with human capital and investing in partner development manager, partner engineers that augment our sales and our engineering teams and our builders that are building to JWCC and C2E, which is national security, three-letter intelligence agencies and Department of Defense outcomes. But that experience in building to those very stringent requirements permeates all the way down and through educational institutions like tier one, R1, research institutions, or all of our local school districts that are yeah. challenged through the pandemic to deliver student outcomes or help students connect to technology in a world where cybersecurity attacks are happening daily. And yet we need continuity of government and continuity of education. Is state and local government also part of the mandate of the organization? Yes. Our sled business, as we refer to it, is state and local in education, and it is a single team. My peer leads that business in Brent Mitchell, and that is really where our deepest Google relationships are. While we may be new as a business unit supporting government, especially federal government at the cleared national security level. We've been in the education business for decades. So the academic institutions, all, all the research institutions, right? That falls under, they have a connection, connective tissue to the government agencies. When you start talking about things like CJIS, which is criminal justice information systems, that ties federal law enforcement back to local, state and local law enforcement as well. So it makes perfect sense that you brought this all together as one cohesive unit. And as you know, I've interviewed several Google leaders recently. In fact, we got to meet back in May at a- Yeah, recent what an amazing piece of property 
on the wharf in New York City, where yeah. we got a chance to connect with many of our ISVs as well. It was such a great forum, and it was striking at that time. Google made some very significant announcements around AI, and you've been seeing from Google that you've been on a tear. You've been playing this fast catch-up as, I'll say, the third dominant hyperscaler. And you're no stranger to this space. So tell us why you're excited to be leading this organization at this time. Everyone I speak with, 100%, is positive on Google. They want our products and our services. They're super excited about our commitment to public sector. And we're working to turn that positivity into help with accreditation and driving revenue through our partners. We need to get more training. We need to get them more familiar with our products and services. Because you mentioned, and we fully acknowledge it, we're playing catch up. The great part is we've got amazing technology and footprint in our commercial regulated industries, whether it's insurance or it's energy sector or gaming or financial services, great strengths of product and services across the alphabet portfolio. Now is the time to apply those learnings, the partnerships, the technology into government in a big way. We're also not new from a human capital perspective. In 2013, when I was at AWS as employee 45, helping the first migrations and the first workloads in the government, it was all around what is cloud? And how do I know I'm secure? And I really like my servers and I want to see the blinking lights. When can I visit your data center? And the answer was, you can't. That's the intent of public cloud and security of the cloud and in the cloud. And things like GovClouds became a thing. Well, the reality is nowadays, GovCloud isn't needed anymore. That was built because you couldn't get physical and logical separation approved through FedRAMP and get an ATO. Google's approach, because we could learn from those that came before us, is we don't need or have a GovCloud per se up to the IL-5 accreditation level. We got to not spend and build those large facilities. We focus time and energy on the engineering efforts to get that accreditation on our commercial cloud which is unique, it's novel, but it's also one of the things that makes me so excited because we can scale differently in this second decade of government public cloud computing. Yeah, I wanna peel back on this a little bit, Troy, right? So when you were in AWS in your role, I was in Microsoft in my role leading the public sector partner business. We were kind of bookends, if you will, at that point, because Google really wasn't in the space yet. And yeah, we were standing up GovClouds. We stood up a GovCloud on the Microsoft side you had on AWS. Let's, I'll call it what it is. We were sort of playing catch up to you at that point. But we had to set up in these discrete data centers. We had, everything had to be separated. And one of the challenges that we had, you had as well, and both those organizations still have is the catch up on the technology side, right? So tell our listeners why that's so unique, what you've done at Google. Yeah, what we both, found at either one of those other cloud providers is classification of data, whether you're a commercial company like a Raytheon, a Lockheed, a Boeing Defense, or you're a financial services company in the U.S. And also my experiences at Amazon Web Services was that our remit there was global public sector in nature. So whether it was working with Canada on protected B and C or IRAP in Australia or what's now become sovereign cloud requirements across Europe or the emergence of a G cloud contract vehicle that's now in its ninth or 10th instantiation in the UK is global governments all have the same challenge. They want or have data sovereignty requirements. They also are governed by laws and regulations that really set the rules of the road of how government buys and partners can sell. But what we really saw was in GovCloud requirements or in migration and movements to the cloud is commercial companies 
yours at the time in Microsoft or mine at the time in Amazon were launching products and services at such a rapid rate, but not considering the security and compliance requirements for government. So you had a service parity problem that was always something was launched at AWS reInvent and still today is a challenge nine months later, 12 months later, working through the accreditation to bring that amazing technology to bear to support government missions. There was always a leg and continues to be a leg when you have separate clouds built for a unique, discrete customer environment. That's why our approach is unique and it's different and it's setting a pathway for service parity across all of the new products and services. When you build for that security paradigm in mind, it ultimately drives that organizational agility. It strengthens the brand. We think it is the long-term strategy of bringing AI or transformative tech to market. It's much beyond compute and storage. It's about outcomes. What you said is so telling right now. We're seeing tectonic shifts, right? The technology is evolving so quickly right now. We can't have nine months to a year of lag time as you bring out technology. So this approach is just astounding to me as somebody in the tech sector, probably for our listeners and partners as well. You know, we also talked about the way you've set up the organization and we were just talking about your board and your astounding board. I was wondering if you share a little bit about where you've been the last few days with your meetings. Well, so we hosted in Austin, Texas, our uh, quarterly board meeting and just some amazing energy focused on our board bringing decades and really centuries of experience in government, whether it's a former two-term governor in our state and local business, or it's a current university president, or a four-star special operations command, or Air Force, Space Force commanding general, or a surgeon general that really understands healthcare from the perspective of serving our veterans. And as a veteran, something that's near and dear and passionate to my heart is how do we help not only those men and women serving in uniforms of all types, you mentioned sieges, first responders, police force, our active duty, our national guard. And when you ask about state and local government, really the tie-ins to state and local start at our national guard level. So how do we work across and pull the customer experience from our board of directors and make sure that where we're going, that first and foremost, it's about supporting mission outcomes. It's about empowering everyone in the organization to innovate. And it really goes to five key areas. It's focus on the user. What do we need to do to improve the mission of that educator? or the mission of that tax examiner or the adjudicator for benefits to make sure that they're paying benefits in a timely manner. There's a, out on YouTube, you'll find a recent quick snippet, few minutes from the state of Wisconsin that says how they use Google technology to adjudicate benefits that were mountains of paper piles that now citizens can get paid for their citizen services and benefits in days versus months. That's delivering a citizen service outcome, but it's focus on the user. It's think 10 X. How do we think about where we're going and make technology 10 X better, deliver 10 X better outcomes. It's really think that exponentially it's launch and iterate, which is what we're doing with partners. We're launching AI. We're building, we're iterating, thinking about problem solving with them. We default to an open architecture. So if the computer storage is on-prem or it's in somebody else's cloud, that's fine. Let's work with your data where it resides. This isn't about just moving data around. It's about using the data, harnessing, making decisions. And then innovation comes everywhere in the organization. So talking with the board around What are the needs and wants of a governor in managing his or her state? Are they really fundamentally any different than a special operator out at the tactical edge? No, the mission is different, but ultimately 
How do you harness technology to have better outcomes? So you mentioned five things. I got focus on user, think 10x, launch and iterate. Innovation was fourth? Default to an open. Default to an open. architecture, right? Yeah. Everything we're building is an open architecture. And then the innovation it. comes from everywhere. And it's important to me that we always ask that question of the innovation from everywhere across our organizations. Good ideas are not isolated to a boardroom or to senior leaders. They come from every piece of the business. Many of our commercial companies that are supporting traditionally small, medium business or large enterprises, that's why I was in New York when we met, is talking to those innovative ISVs that may not know how to work with government, right? They're scared of the contracting process or the routes to market, or how do I get started? Or I've heard about this InQtel or a Cyber. Where do I start? And so our job is cultivate that partnership and their technology, work with the founders, work with the CEO, their help through the routes to market, but also it's connecting to contract vehicles. Because at yes. the end of the day, every technology company wants one thing when they come into government, to know how long is it going to take and how do I get there? Because they believe, and I believe, that it's a consistent revenue stream of customers that need and want our technology, but getting to a contract vehicle and the path to revenue of how do I make money in the cloud or how do I make money with Google is ultimately what every single partnership is about. So that innovation comes from everywhere. It's tapping into innovation in non-traditional pockets of government and bringing those technologies to bear. You know, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that you are a partner first organization. What do you see from the best partnerships that you work with? I'm actually going to start with answering the question on one of the most important things that we do, because everybody thinks of the word partnership and they envision something different. So it's galvanizing yes. on a few terms in government, and it's really partner segmentation. We have regional, national systems integrators. They're focused on a region, or they're focused on a horizontal, they're maybe in transportation, or they're in education, they're in ed tech, right? Clearly define what their mission outcomes are and who their customers are. Then there's our ISV population, our independent software vendor SaaS providers that build great tech that are looking for how do they use our partner ecosystem to accelerate those routes to market. Then we have small social economic disadvantaged partners that the government small business administration identifies as ADA, service disabled veteran owned small businesses, hub zone, women-owned, historically black college diversity areas that are routes to market and that contract vehicles are very important, especially in civilian government agencies. So no. clearly working to curate, work with those small businesses that can't become large, right? By cap, by statute, they are exactly where they want to be and where the founders started those companies. We have to curate them from a large Google partner ecosystem and give them unique support to help them grow their business. And then we've got the federal systems integrators and the global systems integrators, the Accentures, the Deloitte's, the CGI's of the world, or our national scale partners that have been working with our customers for decades. You know them from your Microsoft days. I know them very, from my Dell days. It's CDW, it's SHI, it's Insight, but it's us thinking about working with them differently than, and if I can elaborate on exactly what I mean, I think it's the cornerstone of the answer to how do I make money as a partner with Google Cloud? And the challenge is that historically speaking, the consumption-based economics of cloud have really been hard. It used yeah. to be in the days when uh, we were selling hardware or partnering with companies that were, you built, 
you ship, you invoice, and a salesperson knew exactly what their margin at a partner they were paid on, and you got paid in 45 to 90 days from the government. And then you looked at, okay, what's the life cycle of that software license or that hardware license? Cloud flipped that dynamics upside down in the public sector just 10 years ago with the award of the C2S contract vehicle. So partners had to learn along the way. But my experience globally is that government wants a solution. 80% of that bid is for services. It's for human capital. It's for come implement, run, operate something. 20% is for infrastructure. But if that system's integrated, that prime contractor can't get right what the consumption is going to be over three to five years, that's their biggest risk. It's why they were reluctant to scale in government. How do you price that? How do you bid and win and manage to profitability over three to five years? There's things called enterprise agreements or EAs, right? We have that too. It's called a commit. Problem is that's just committing to a spend dollar. It's not being fiscally responsible to a three-year, five-year annual fiscal cycle in government. So we've done the public sector subscription agreement that our teams did the engineering work, working to a government specifications, pass that through our distribution partners, Kerasoft or TD Cenex, with a single SKU from fixed price for a duration of the contract where they can use and leverage any of our Google tech. So we innovate, we launch a new product. It comes out um, in our commercial regions, meets government requirements. Customer can use that. They can innovate. We want them to. We want them to innovate new product services outcomes because that way our partners can expand. They can yeah. renew contracts. They can upsell. But it's delivering what the government's always wanted in a unique way. And that's tell me how much this is going to cost. I need a firm fixed price for it so I can budget for it. And it sounds like you've simplified the process. You've been able to achieve that objective, which is so hard in the, in the cloud space, as we both know. We have COVID was the catalyst because yeah. state and local governments needed a solution. Now, I need a COVID tracker. I need to modernize my government services because I need driver's license, motor vehicle registration. I need this implemented in two days, two weeks. How much is it going to cost me? Give me a fixed dollar amount because I have a budget I need to know. We learned a lot through COVID and now we can bring that to bear across all government. So let's dive in on the right type of partners, the best partners, the ones that you see that do the best results within your business. And this goes back to your Dell days and your AWS days. What do you see from the best of the best? Those that have engineering tech skills, right? It's understanding the technology and how to apply it against either partner or customer requirements and thinking about what pieces, parts, components of that solution. Very few of our customers will ever have only a single piece of technology in their procurement. It will be multiple ISV solutions. So keeping it simple across the partner landscape of here's what we do. Here's the problem this solves. Not speeds and feeds. The best partners talk about problems and outcomes. And it starts with technical expertise, but then it focuses on the sales motions. Who is the customer? What problem are we trying to solve? And then how do we get momentum? Starts with a single referenceable customer. If the customer will tell the story, that is the best sales motion you have. Because yeah. government, our taxpayer dollars are not spent on innovative groundbreaking new technology, right? So how do we speed up that innovation cycle? We find the customers that can break down that cycle, accelerate, and then we help them tell their story. Every educational institution wants to talk about the innovation that they have for their student outcomes. It's now law in many states. State of Texas here, my home state, is for community colleges. It's now law to report on student outcomes because of the volume of federal and state money. 
So how do we help them do that? It's a data problem. And then how do we find forums and off of which to help our partners tell those stories? I'm looking forward to our next conference here in a couple of weeks in San Francisco, where my panel that I'm presenting on is not about Google speeds and feeds or tech. I've got a customer on stage from the state of Minnesota nice. and a customer on stage from the state of California talking about how they worked with partners and in this case, Insight in Minnesota and Deloitte in California and Google technology to produce outcomes. That's right. us giving back to the partner community of the best thing that Google can do is our advertising footprint, our market share is telling a partner story. And I am not going to put out a press release, a wind wire or any blog in the public sector without the reference to a partner because we're partner first. There's a partner on every deal. We're going to tell those stories with customers and partner outcomes. And that is a different way of thinking about accelerating the pulse. I'm so excited to announce our continued partnership with AG1. Many of you know I made taking a green drink supplement, part of my health ritual for over 21 years now. And it has made all the difference to my health and well-being. Over six years ago, I found Athletic Greens, and now their product, AG1, became my go-to supplement. AG1 is the first thing I take every morning to power my day. It covers all of my nutritional bases, supports my gut health, gives a boost to my immunity, and energy levels. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash Vince M. That's drinkag1.com forward slash Vince M. Check it out. So exciting. We're, we're going to provide links in our show notes to that session. I, I believe viewers can watch it, right? Remotely. You don't have to yes. be physically at the Moscow. And it's Museum. part of the next partner sessions. So it should be open to all registered partners. So generative AI, right? It's been on the top of everyone's mind these days. And we talked about the event in May and some of the information and also the Google IO event that took place simultaneously. Some believe that Google got a later start than the other guys. And I was at that event in New York with you as we discussed and heard from your leaders. What is Google's strategy in generative AI? We definitely didn't get a late start, right? We've been in AI for a long time. And when we think about the culture of innovation, it's in our principles. It's Absolutely. Google principles about amazing world-class commercial brand that we have bringing innovation to government. Examples of that include generative AI. And it's really around the long game is making sure that the answers and the technology derived can really meet mission outcomes. It's one thing for you or I to go ask for a sample of, hey, plan a trip for me. It's another for us to make, you know, very informed, long-term decisions that have, can have national or regional impact through only technology. And so when we think about the human experience, it's the culture and procurement barriers that exist in government that block government adoption of tech. How do we help break those down? So our long game is working with our federal government and our state government on AI principles, both ours and theirs, about how tech will be adopted. And then it's finding better ways to do mission support. But we are doing that today through applied AI and machine learning, right? Whether it's enterprise search for government, it's conversational AI, it's CAI call centers that function in the local language of a citizen that English may not be a first language. How do we help with the common data exploration problems of I'm searching a website, but I don't really get the answer because it's stagnant, it existed forever, or it's got pointers to five other government agencies 
that tech exists today to give me the answer I'm searching for without redirecting me to another site. What is Google search? That's the extension of Google search is every one of us, that's where we go, right? We're looking for answers to open data set problems. And whether it's automated document processing, I gave the example of Wisconsin taking a mountain of data, automating it to make real-time decisions or multilingual chat capabilities that exist now across websites. That's applying AI. What's coming in the future? Super exciting of where can we go with large language models? But we're just getting started on that problem set. Some really exciting things happening in your world. And I, if I'm a partner, I'm going to be pretty excited about potentially working with your organization. Troy, how can they more effectively work with your organization? If I'm a partner listening or watching today, what can I do to enlist, enroll, be part of your world? Yeah. And have, I think we should also post my work contact information because it starts with a conversation, right? It's that here's what we're good at. Here's what we don't know. Here's the addressable market we'd like to start with. And I start every conversation with oftentimes backing up that partner conversation that starts with, I want to connect with your field sellers. Okay, but let's use a analogy to building a house. If the plumbing's not in place, you move into that house, you transact that first transaction and it doesn't go well. That second, third, fifth transaction doesn't scale. Let's get the plumbing in place first. Accreditations into our, our partner programs. Connect the contract vehicles. Then we run sales plays. We do outbound calls. Then we it's sales 101 at that point. That's when we connect to regional sellers on the ground with a solution in a contract vehicle, we meet the customers together, then we market, we blog, we talk about on stage the solution, then we get scale. We do the plumbing first and it starts with contact us, work with us, align to a partner development manager and a partner engineer on our team so that we can get you to the appropriate technology intersections. So. Let's just shift gears here. As you know, I'm fascinated with the career journey. You've had an incredible career. Was there a spark that got you on the path to this amazing success that you've had in your career? Yeah, right. I get asked this question oftentimes in mentorship sessions of how to think about a career journey. And mine really was, I didn't find technology as my career path, right? It found me but it does go back to why I'm passionate about this customer set. And as we were talking about before we started, University of Minnesota and ROTC was my path. But both of my parents were educated. My sister and I graduated high school the same day, and we were both going off to college, her to Berkeley, and I myself to University of Minnesota on an ROTC scholarship. It was a way to fund college. And through that experience and some amazing mentors that had given me a career to service to the U.S. Army. One of those mentors, his name was Brian Singbush. He has since passed away, but he was a special operator and a sniper during Mogadishu. issue. But I thought I wanted to be an infantry officer. And over multiple conversations and mentorship sessions, he said, Troy, the next conflicts hopefully don't involve humans on the ground, right? They need military intelligence officers, communications officers, or signal officers, right? It's going to be through the advent of technology. And he helped steer me towards a pathway that was the start of my career. Spend time in, as a signal officer, first deployment, or really for my first assignment as 21 years old, I'm in Korea. So I really got the perspective over 18 months of the global landscape and the networking architecture that ties our world together. And then at Fort Bragg, I had a career direction change. Jumped out of an airplane one night. The result didn't go well, ruptured my discs in my back. And what was that change in career direction, why I'm passionate about helping our veterans 
and those service men and women that are transitioning. Maybe it was planned for them. Maybe it wasn't. So I have a favorite question. And this is one I love to ask, especially my special guests like you. You're hosting a dinner party and you could host this dinner party anywhere in the world. We could talk about that. And you can invite any three guests from the present or the past to this amazing dinner party. Who would you invite, Troy, and why? Having listened to multiple of your podcasts, this is a question I thought about for a while because I think it's fascinating. But I'm going to start off and say I am in sales after all. So I'm going to try to upsell and say three guests is not enough. That's just a small, that's just a small round table. Let's think about, you know, expanding that a little bit. I want to keep it intimate, but I'm asking for six. So, all right, we're going to make the table larger. We're going to make gonna the table make larger. larger. So okay. as we've talked about my history and background, I think a hit from a military perspective, a Dwight Eisenhower, right? Oh. One of only five generals that ever reached five star and is known as a historical tactician, but he also went on to be president of the United States. On the politics side, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan. Distinguished gentlemen, right? One has an amazing legacy of preserving the union, ending slavery, creating the possibility of freedoms in the U.S. And Ronald Reagan for all the work pre-Cold War in changing the economy. I have to, as a big sports guy, it has to be Herb Brooks. I got to meet Coach Brooks. As a young hockey player, I skated on the ice with him as a coach in Minnesota. We all know, I believe in miracles in the 80 Olympic team, but honestly, setting a goal, working hard, and then capitalizing on a few breaks. I mean, beating the Russians is what we all know and think about in the Olympics. That was not the gold medal game. I like to remind people all the time. It was another game to play the next day. Imagine how hard that is when the greatest accomplishment that nobody believed you could do wasn't for the gold medal. You had to go play the next day and you had to come from behind again. I'd add Tiger Woods as well. Not because of the legacy. I am a golfer. My son's on the uh, high school golf team, but I'm fascinated by the PGA policy board assignment this week, right? Of taking a player that's in the latter stages of his professional career, but that is really leading a global set of golfers that either want to or desire to be PGA professionals or today in that big business of a policy board and all the global implications that it has in that transition also to the poli- the political environment. I think that will be a fascinating one to watch. And then the other two people I'd add, Joe Rogan, podcaster. I'd love to have Joe Rogan here on the podcast. Can we I, bring him all? We'll, I, we'll, 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 I, we'll bring podcast here with me. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, fellow Austinite, right? As Joe moved to Austin. Yep. But why I think that is that the... Narrative changes of how technology, right? This platform that we're on today, the ability to take journalism and change the paradigm of how we're delivering from paper to television to now the power of the internet, YouTube, anything I want to do or learn about, it's now on YouTube, right? An amazing Google property. It's also why and how our global network was built out. It was to support all the Google and Alphabet properties. And then the, the last one that's near and dear to my heart, so the sixth person I'm bringing, I'm going to bring my son Tanner because this nice. experience is about the next generation. And I would not want him to not get to have the experience real hand from sports, military, entertainment, and some of the best policy and military minds that we've ever had. I love the question, though, and it was a fun one to think through of curating that table um, because there's a lot of great choices out there. Well, you know, we got Tiger Woods is down here in Jupiter, so we could host it in Jupiter, but your choice on locations, we could decide. And then 
certainly I would want to at least come by and I, I have to help you put, put, make a bigger table. So maybe you could fit another person. I certainly would love to be in this room. What a fascinating conversation. Vince, look at you up solid too. I love it. That's what partnerships I, are about. Not, you know, <laughs> that's what partnerships are about. It's a give and get, right? right? Absolutely. So Troy, you've been an, an amazing guy. I'm so excited to have you share your story today. Spend some time. I'm going to have to have you back. I'm, I'm looking forward to spending more time with you in the future. But what advice do you have for our partners that are wishing to build their business this year? This again, this has been a year where we've seen some headwinds, but it's still the most exciting year I remember. And, and again, you talked about working with your organization, but what about building their business this year? Yeah. It is about slowing down to speed up. We used to talk about that all the time in the military. To go faster, sometimes you need to slow down. Get really concentrated. Keep it simple. Understand who you are as a company, what technology you're really great at delivering today, what your business model is, and have a vision of where you want to go. But I use a prop all the time for my teams. Last year on stage, I talked about it. It's a hockey puck. It is clearly identifiable. It's one inch by three inches, weighs six ounces, made of galvanized rubber. If you never played hockey, you know what it is. You know what it's used for. All of our programs, all of our offerings, all of the routes to market have to be as simple to identify and understand as a hockey puck. And if they are, then when we present them to customers, there's an aha moment. I know what to do with this. I know how to buy it. I know how to measure its success and get repeatability. So it does go back to keep it simple to go faster and think about a hockey puck with everything we do because it's identifiable and I get how to then take and work with you as a company or I endeavor to make my programs as simple as that hockey puck. And if I don't, my ask as a partner is, raise your hand, tell me, this isn't what I need. And we'll iterate and we'll change and we'll adapt. Uh, I love this advice. For any person working in the business sector, but especially working with you and your organization, Troy, so great to have you as a guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. I so enjoyed our time today. Yeah, thank you very much. Look forward to talking soon in the future and also hopefully at next here this month or at our public sector event in Washington, D.C. in early October. Really looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Troy. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Troy was just an amazing guest, such an incredible public sector leader, a disabled veteran, partner and business leader at Dell, AWS, and now Google Cloud. If you want to see Troy's session at Next or attend his event, follow the link in the show notes. I want to thank you for listening and joining Ultimate Partner. If you liked today's episode, please hit the subscribe button at the top of this podcast. And if you'd like to stay ahead of all the exciting announcements and excitement coming to Ultimate Guide to Partnering, please sign up to our newsletter at ultimateguidetopartnering.com and stay tuned as we have so much more planned ahead to help you achieve your greatest results. Thank you for listening and thank you for following the ultimate guide to partner.